Redefining Poverty, Why Depth is a Necessary Measurement. There are currently varying definitions of poverty such that even the experts can't decide. For example, analyst John Iceland offers an overview of many different ways to define poverty, but suggests that one definition would be by means of economic resources or the lack thereof. Meanwhile, analyst Amartya Sen argues that poverty is more so the deprivation of a person's capabilities and capabilities to succeed. Even others have argued that poverty has to do with a state in which someone is socially excluded from their peers. Sen and Nussbaum have similar definitions of poverty. They both believe that capabilities should be a central part of poverty discussions. Money is not what's important to them. What's important is people's ability to live a good and meaningful life. However, we've decided to define poverty as a person's limited capabilities mostly due to that person's low income. This can be depicted from this Venn diagram where on one side you have low income and on the other side you have limited capabilities. And we believe poverty is what exists in this overlapping space in between. And the size of these pieces is arbitrary, but it's the important part is that poverty is low income as a result of limited capabilities. And you can have examples of where someone may have low income but sufficient capabilities such as a recent college graduate or limited capabilities but sufficient income such as a person with a disability. So now that you understand the people on the outside of this overlap, you might be asking who are the impoverished people that exist in the middle? According to our definition, an impoverished person is someone who has limited capabilities due to that low income. This may manifest in things such as limited health care, limited education, limited employment opportunities, limited nutrition, limited housing options, etc. But overall, it's a combination of all these type of factors that limits a person's capabilities. And that being said, I think it's important to note that there is a complex relationship between income and capabilities. And this sets up a cycle in which each factor often depends on the other. Poverty is often quoted as having a cyclical nature, and cycles are often very hard to break. We also believe that there needs to be a better, more practical, and more effective way to measure poverty in the United States. The original poverty measurement through the government was the OPM, but the SPM was later developed to cover several flaws of the OPM, such as geographical difference, differences in family composition, and what is actually counted as income. The SPM also accounts for necessary health, transportation, and child care expenses. SPM allows the government to better gauge poverty in the United States and help funnel money where it will be most effective. As shown on this map, the OPM and SPM often yield different results. The states here in red capture a higher percentage of poverty using the SPM, while the states in blue captured a higher percentage of those in poverty using the OPM. In general, the SPM tends to be higher than the OPM in states with a higher cost of living due to the geographical adjustments of the SPM. Nevertheless, it's problematic that these measures can produce such differing data. When the first poverty line was developed in the 1960s, the average family spent about one third of their income on food. The government had reasonably strong numbers for the minimum cost of food, so they defined the poverty line as three times a minimum food cost, or a food basket. Over time, food has gotten cheaper and is now a much smaller share of people's expenses. It is currently estimated to be only one-sixth of the average family spending. However, the OPM poverty line is still set at three times the food cost adjusted for inflation. To us, this measurement is outdated because the average household is spending less on food and more on other necessities and amenities in the 21st century. The SPM introduces the FCSU basket, which we feel is more accurate for modern society. And this basket includes food, clothing, shelter, and utilities. And how the poverty line is calculated is 1.2 times the spending level on FCSU of the 33rd percentile household in the United States. But neither the OPM nor the SPM addresses something that we will call the depth of poverty. 
Though many Americans may fall below the poverty line, we believe that each household may deal with a different type or degree of poverty. For example, in the graph shown above, all Americans below the red line are officially considered poor because they fall below this arbitrary poverty line. Yet we would argue that family A, B, and C are living in very different conditions. For example, family C is probably worse off than family A because of their depth below the red poverty line. The variance and poverty gap can be seen in these two graphs where we compare country A with country B. Both countries have a 50% poverty rate, but they are not the same when you look closer. Country A has a much higher poverty gap. As you can see, there are more people further away from the um, poverty line, while country B has an even distribution, so less people are further away from that poverty line. So while they have the same poverty rate on the surface, Country A would be poorer than country B. And it is also important to know about people who are just over the poverty line because they can be at risk for falling below. And it's good to have policies in place to keep them buoyant so you don't have to worry about them falling below poverty. And it is nice to take care of problems before they become bigger problems. As noted, the poverty line is relatively absolute, which leaves room for many people to fall into near poverty. In the diagram above, though family one is technically just above the poverty line, they are likely very similar to family two, who falls just below the poverty line. Family one is probably still struggling, even though they are not considered impoverished according to the current standards. Robert Rector believes that our current poverty measurements are misleading. And this is because most people think of poverty as extreme poverty, such as starvation or homelessness, but that is not how most poor people actually live. For instance, the poor of today live much better than the poor 50 years ago. Here are some headlines from analyst Robert Rector from within the past few years. Rector clearly has a very cynical view as he believes that the war on poverty has been a colossal flop and that the U.S. is fighting poverty by promoting poverty. He tries to convince readers that poverty is not that bad because the average impoverished home often has air conditioning, cable TV, or an Xbox. One focal point of Rector's argument are these two graphs listed in the slides. And you can see on the left, you see the amenities that all households in the U.S. have. And on the right is the amenities that all poor households in the U.S. have. And there's a pretty similar like distribution between the poor and all households which depicts that even poor people have the basic necessities such as refrigerator, refrigerators, stove, oven, microwaves, air conditioners, etc. However, we believe that Rector is missing the point. Poverty takes on many different forms and comes with varying consequences. By looking at depth of poverty, it is easier to understand how some families are doing better than others. Besides material wealth, it is important to note that poverty can come with intangibles, such as emotional distress, poor mental and physical health, or social exclusion. These factors extend far beyond any poverty measure. Depth measurements are also use, useful for policymakers, as certain types of welfare can be chosen to target specific groups to be more effective at combating poverty.